back to your um, everyday jobs that you work so hard at in our community. Um, but if I could just introduce um, Josh Bays. He is with Site Selection Group. Uh, the Balance Allowance Development Authority hired um, Site Selection Group to take a competitive analysis of our community uh, from an economic development perspective. Um, Josh has experience in site selection and working with communities, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but we're glad to welcome him to South Austin Lowndes County and looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So thank you, Josh. Yep. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Uh, to kind of give a little bit of introduction, I'll, I'll talk about uh, my background and our firm a little bit, and essentially what we did for, for the county in Valdosta, as well as some of our, our key takeaways from that. But I have a pretty informal style of presenting, so I'd rather this be a, a dialogue. If anyone has any questions or discussion topics, please feel free to, to raise those. At the end, we'll try to allocate a little bit of time to discuss some of this stuff. and. Um, and, and maybe be able to provide some feedback. So who's Site Selection Group? So Site Selection Group, we're a, what we call a corporate location advisory group. We're headquartered in Dallas. We have roughly, I think, 32 employees now. 90% um, of our work are helping companies find optimal locations for either their labor or capital intensive projects. So we have kind of two types of projects that we work on. One is what we call professional services. That's call center, back office, shared service, corporate headquarter type projects. And the other side is industrial, manufacturing and distribution. I'm a principal over the industrial side of business, so I exclusively work with manufacturing companies, distribution companies, finding their, their next home. Um, we offer three fundamental services to clients. One is location advisory. So that's the consulting behind making sure they're choosing the optimal location. You know, that's driven by workforce, logistics, utilities, infrastructure, real estate, business environment, economic incentives, all of those factors shape the decisions or influence the decisions that our, that our clients are making. The second is we offer full slate of economic incentive services. So on behalf of companies, we're identifying, negotiating, securing, and helping with the ongoing compliance of economic incentives for their project. And much like incentives, we offer a full slate of real estate services, so identifying, negotiating, and securing real estate. Um, so the, those three services, this is kind of our value proposition. When a company hires us, we're going to find them the optimal location, we're going to maximize leverage from an economic incentives and real estate perspective, and then we're going to help them with the ongoing compliance, specifically for um, economic incentives. On the industrial side, we typically do anywhere between 30 and 40 projects a year. Um, I spend probably three days a week on the road in various communities, usually with a client in tow touring that community as they're evaluating it uh, for their particular project. So I mentioned 90% of our work is corporate work. Um, the other 10% of our time, from time to time, communities or states or electric utilities or whoever it may be that has an economic development function will hire us to provide an objective assessment kind of through the corporate lens, basically using the same practices we use for our corporate clients, adapting it and giving objective feedback. So that said, I've never worked a day in economic development. Um, I've spent my entire career in corporate site selection, and so that's really the perspective I bring. So as I talk through some of this stuff, what we did here in Valdosta, it's basically employing a lot of the same principles we would use if we were evaluating Valdosta on behalf of a, of a corporate client. That's what Compete Now is. So Compete Now is just uh, it's a term we've coined to, to coin some of the economic development um, services that we offer. So if you look at the site selection process, um, to the extent there is a typical process, it's going to follow something like this, a six-phase filtering process. So site selection is actually, um, the, the term's counterintuitive. The process is actually a deselection process. It's a top-down. You start with everything, you whittle down until you find the optimal location. And that's essentially what this process is. I mean, like most consulting engagements, when a company hires us, we're spending a lot of time on the front end of the project, understanding their needs and all of that. And then we go into a community filtering exercise. And that's literally where we're taking a typical project for me comes and says, we need to be east of the Mississippi River and south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, go. In that second phase, that's where we take that entire geography and try to identify the maybe 10 to 12 good candidate options that warrant a comprehensive analysis, which is the third phase. Um, 
in which we do a thorough comprehensive analysis with the objective of getting down to two to three communities uh, to, to go conduct what we call tours and on-site due diligence, where we come spend a full day in each community um, accomplishing all the things needed to make a decision, which leads into negotiations from an economic incentives and real estate perspective. This exercise for Valdosta, we essentially kind of touched on three portions of this process. One, we did a community filtering exercise to see how Valdosta ranks in the initial phases of the site selection process. And the reason that's critical is because during that process, very rarely are communities ever engaged. So they're basically being evaluated and with no or lim limited interaction. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we did. The second is, in the more kind of thorough analysis, what we would typically do is we would do a lot of employer interviews. We did a few employer interviews here. And we put together what we call an operating cost analysis. So for a series of, of three different projects, which I'll show you in a second, we, um, we calculated what it would cost to operate that facility here in Valdosta versus 10 other benchmark communities on a 10-year basis. And then the last is, is we did a, a, a cursory review of your economic incentives and how that compares in our experience to communities of like size in the Southeast United States. Um, we did these things making kind of three fundamental assumptions or three mock type projects. One was through the lens of an advanced manufacturing project. The second was through the lens of just your general assembly, general production type project. And the third was a shared services IT type project. And so we tried to make sure they were realistic to what a project that would be interested in about DASA would be representative of the project specs of that. For example, head counts anywhere from 100 to 150 people, capital investment of 20 to 30 million dollars, um, you know, relatively large or average. Um, building and land size, moderate utility consumption, just basically indicative of 90% of the projects that are out there. So if you look at project flow <coughs> across the nation, 90% are going to be indicative of this type of project. Um, you have your big OEM projects, your Volvo's, your Airbus, your you, we hear about those because they dominate the news, but reality is that's less, less than 10% of the projects out there. And so even though every single community would like to have something like that in their backyard, we had to be realistic when we assess this. And so we looked at it through these, through these three lenses. And I'm going to skip some of this stuff is in as is in relevant as this. This is really hard to see, um, so I'm just going to articulate some of the stuff that's on this slide. The very first thing we did is what we did call, we built what we call community filtering analysis. And that's essentially where we take every single metropolitan and micropolitan statistical area in the country, there's 940 of them, and we score and rank them based on weighted site selection variables. We built three versions of this model based on the three projects you just saw. The weightings you see up here happen to be for the advanced manufacturing one. But essentially, we scored every single community based on a host of labor availability metrics, labor cost metrics, and business environment metrics. So under labor availability, that includes things like labor scalability, and how fast can you scale the workforce, target occupation presence, industry presence, education attainment, age characteristics, income, uh, college and university presence and output, uh, and then labor costs, obviously wages and salaries and some of your income statistics, and then business environment, your tax climate, organized labor environment, as well as utility costs. And so, when we're doing this, doing projects for a corporate client, this is usually kind of the first step. The idea, the, the goal or objective of building a weighted site selection model like this isn't to necessarily choose the ideal location. It is to eliminate the stuff that just isn't going to work and identify maybe 10 to 12 communities that warrant an on a more comprehensive type analysis. When we built this for the advanced manufacturing, um, and, and by the way, the reason that we built this community filtering analysis for Valdosta is because we needed to identify a, a dozen or so competitive communities 
to benchmark them against as we did some of these other analyses. And we wanted to make sure we were choosing some more of the competitive locations. Um, when we did this, this slide essentially shows how Valdosta scored. So you had kind of your three big categories, labor availability, labor costs, and business environment. Anytime you see an index of 100%, that's average. So we set average at 100%. Anything above 100% is more favorable than average. Anything below is, is less than favorable. Across the board, as we walk through some of these, you'll notice that the community scores very well from a cost perspective, especially a workforce cost perspective, as well as a business environment. It scores incredibly favorable. On some of these more specialized projects, like in advanced manufacturing, it doesn't score as well from a labor availability. So what I'm suggesting is, if we were doing this on behalf of a, of a, of a client and looking at, you know, we had a 150 person advanced manufacturing project that needed to hire engineers and specialized talent, the odds that that project would have engaged the community or, or Andrew's organization to keep going are, are relatively low. And it's mainly because of this labor availability metric. We did that for, um, you know, just a general assembly type project. And the fundamental difference between advanced manufacturing project and more you're just general manufacturing is the need for specialized talent. Um, you know, most advanced manufacturing operations have an R&D component to it. They employ engineers. They employ more a, a higher level of professional talent. Um, whereas your general assembly is mainly just your unskilled and skilled workforce. They might have some machining capabilities, maintenance mechanics, welders, and things like that, which when you look at Valdosta from a general assembly perspective, the labor availability actually scored really well. Um, and that's not too surprising because if, if you take a tour around the community, which I did this morning, spent a couple hours driving around with Andrea looking at the existing industry, that's very indicative of, of what you have here already. Um, Okay. We also did this from a shared service IT type project, and Dados actually scored really well across the board on this as well. Um, so when you look at these kind of three types of projects, it, basically what we were trying to do is demonstrate where your competitive strengths might be. Um, I'm suggesting today as the community assets sit right now, it's more for your general assembly and shared service type projects than it would be advanced manufacturing. Now that doesn't really come, that, that probably shouldn't surprise a lot of people, and I can explain later on um, why that is and, and what can be done if, if attracting these more high-end projects are a priority of the community. And, and it might not be, um, but it's, it's a, Whenever I'm doing this, the big, even when I'm touring communities with, with companies, the biggest mistake I see communities make is not understanding what their target market is, not understanding what's realistic types of projects for their community and expending resources trying to attack the wrong type of project. And that's essentially what we're trying to do here. So when we did these analyses, we kind of looked at what competitive communities scored really well across the board for those three types of projects so we could benchmark um, Valdosta to each of those. Some of these were more strategic. You know, I, it, it was a little bit informal. I asked Andrea who she sees herself competing against when RFPs come through the state or whatever. Who, who are the kind of the usual suspects that, that the community is typically competing against? So we threw in a few of those even though they might not have scored as well. Um, obviously, you always want to include a community like Atlanta because it's the big brother up the street that is the big mega tier one community in this part of the world. And we tried to pick a couple from each of the surrounding states. Um, that was incredibly important when we started looking at things like economic incentives to give you a sense of how not only local incentives fare, but state economic incentives um, fare. So when we did that operating cost analysis and an incentives comparison, you're basically comparing it to these communities. All of the stuff I talked about prior to this was the science behind choosing these communities as a, as a comparative location. So in operating cost analysis, whenever 
we're in that comprehensive site selection phase and we've got a dozen different communities we're considering. One of the things we're gonna do, or any company should do and probably is doing, is looking at least on a 10 year basis of what it's gonna cost to operate a plant in that facility. So that's taking everything into consideration, wages and salaries, benefits, training, utilities, transportation costs, tax, climate, real estate, all of those things and integrating it into one cost model. Based on those project criteria I shared with you earlier, we did three versions of this operating cost. So you can understand the cost advantages that Valdosta might, might, um, might give to a, a particular prospect. And the reason that's important is because most communities know my wages are a dollar cheaper, or I can shave a cent per kilowatt hour off my electric rates, or my tax rate is this percent less than my neighbor. But very rarely do they take the time to put together an integrated cost model and understand where those savings actually are. If you look from an advanced manufacturing of all of those communities that we compare, and I realize this is really small, the only number I really want you to focus on is this number right here, is 9.52%. The most expensive two it were Lake City, Florida, and Atlanta, Georgia for this particular type of project. And what I'm suggesting is a company just by locating here can save 10% over those two on a 10-year basis on a, on a fully integrated model. You can save 10% um, across the board. For a general assembly, it was about 9%. Um, out of all of those competitive locations, this was the lowest cost option. And that wasn't by design. We didn't, we didn't intentionally choose expensive locations to compare it to. That's, the, matter of fact, we actually did the opposite. We tried to find very competitive locations. Um, and so it, basically 9%. And then on shared service healthcare IT, it was actually 20%. And the reason is, is if you look at the cost structure of more of your professional service type projects as opposed to your industrial, labor costs make up the biggest proportion of that, whereas that's one of the biggest advantage of a community like this. And so it, it impacts savings significantly. Then I asked Andrea to give us a half a dozen employers that we could speak with. And the reason that this is important is in the entire site selection process, you can, you can do as much statistics analysis as you want to do. You can do as much research as you want to do. At the end of the day, if employers aren't advocating your community, you're fighting an uphill battle from an economic development perspective. Whenever I see companies make location decisions, it's usually because of the endorsement of local employers. They put their testimony above anything else in this entire site selection process. And so since we kind of limited the scope of our engagement, one of the things I insisted on is let, let us do a few employ, uh, employment interviews because that's a very cost effective way for us to come in and get the pulse of a community um, relatively quickly and relatively accurately. And if the perception of the employer isn't really indicative of what's going on in the community, it's still relevant because that's what you would be judged on by companies that were evaluating the region. So we, had, we were set up with half a dozen proposed interviewees. Only four, um, four agreed to, to speak with us. It was staff. It was who they were. Um, it, was, it was two manufacturers and two distribution. It was CJB, SAF, Second Harvest, and Smith Drug. Um, and so, you know, we have a very standard employer interview questionnaire we go through that covers everything from workforce to education to operating environment, just understanding their overall experience of operating um, in the community. The people that we spoke with is actually a really good cross-section of, of presidents of companies who have operated here for 20 plus years and people who had just moved here and giving us kind of their initial impressions of doing business here for only a couple of years. And so essentially what we did is we've got a bunch of categories we kind of score on a one to five scale so we can, we can make some type of comparison. We don't need to go through that. I've provided all of that to Andrea so you can look at that at your leisure. But I just want to talk about some of the some of the feedback they got. Um, 
overall labor availability for your, for your unskilled and your just generally skilled workforce was actually pretty good. Um, I got better employer testimony on that aspect than we do in most communities of this size. Workforce is a problem all across, especially in the Southeast United States. It's very rare that we evaluate a community and there's not some type of significant workforce challenge. I was pleasantly surprised hearing their ability to hire, attract, hire, and retain kind of your unskilled and semi-skilled type workforce. Um, they all agreed with all of the, the cost data out there that this was a very cost-effective place. Um, in every instance we do an employer interview, we ask them to rank how their local operation compares to other operations they have uh, across the United States. And across the board, this was one of their lowest cost operations. So it's good to validate some of their testimony and some of the other information that we, that we, um, that we researched. Um, there was a challenge of attracting specialized and highly skilled labor to the area, mainly engineering talent. Um, so basically, finding that engineering talent in, in other markets, whether it's Atlanta or wherever it may be, and attracting them um, to, to the local operations. From an education perspective, all were very complimentary of the local um, post-secondary education institutions. It seemed quite a few of these work with Wiregrass, um, developing a, a, a pipeline of workers. And you know we got we got positive feedback of, on that sense, which is very critical because, as you know, if, if you're entering a community, you you can either hire from the ranks of the unemployed slash underemployed, you can attract people to the region, or you can develop the talent out of the college and university system. And so one of those three big issues, it seemed that there's three big areas the employers had a very favorable experience doing that here. Operating environment, again, low operating environment or low cost structure. Obviously, transportation and logistics is one of the big assets of the region. We, we all know that. Don't need to, to spend a lot of time discussing that. Good rail access, access to ports. I mean, everybody knows where, where you sit on a map. Um, no concerns from, from uh, organized labor, which is pretty common. And the no concern part is pretty common in the, in the southeast United States. Um, and then, and then low cost of utilities. Government support services, um, positive view of, of, of economic development efforts with a few compliments and a few critiques, but if there was one thing that was consistent across the board was we kept hearing a lack of cooperation locally. And I don't know if that's a perceived issue, I don't know if that's a real issue, I, I don't know. But I know that the perception among employers exists that there's a specific lack of cooperation from the city and county. As an outsider that spent two hours here this morning, I, I mean, I, I don't know much more than that, but that that perception exists. Um, so overall, you know, pretty good interviews. They validated a lot of the research um, that it went into this. Basically, if you're coming here trying to hire unskilled, semi-skilled workforce, you're not going to have a problem. If you're trying to hire a bunch of engineers, you're going to have a problem. Um, <coughs> Low-cost structure, the only big kind of red flag that if I was doing this on behalf of a corporate client would require a whole lot of vetting was just the, the local, I don't want to say stability because that's, that's the wrong word, but the whole perceived lack of cooperation. Um, as a consultant, on behalf of my client, I would really try to get to the bottom of that. Um, and a high quality of life. So economic incentives. One of the things we asked Andrea to do is, you know, if, if a project like this came across your desk, how do you think the community <coughs> would incentivize it? Um, and I think you might have erred on this side of caution here and been a little bit more conservative with it. Um, it, this is essentially the types of, of package we would have got for this project. And so, essentially it was a um, reduction in real personal property tax, uh, subsidized land prices, um, obviously your state, your state, um, state incentives, which is mainly in Georgia, job tax credit, um, and then expedited permitting, which obviously expedited permitting is tough to value that, so we didn't include that as a line item. But you see kind of what the total packages would have been valued at. So for that advanced manufacturing, 
about five and a half million dollars on a thirty million dollar capital investment. General Assembly, just a shade over three million on a twenty million dollar, and then kind of your shared service, almost two million on a five million. So, kind of based on our experience doing this, and we also did a lot of research pulling comps from all those competitive communities. How does that stack up? We have a, we provided Andrea with a, a lot of documentation behind this, but I'm going to try to sum this up in one slide. Let me kind of show you how to read this. The way, and this is for local incentives, the way site selection grew, if you were asking us to rank um, a local incentive package on what's average, what's competitive, and what's highly competitive, it would include these components. So the top box is what we would view as an average local incentive package. Some type of property tax abatement, expedited permits, and permit waivers. To kind of take that to the next level and say what I would call competitive, I would say free or discounted real estate of some sort um, for a project like this. All, obviously competitive includes the, the average. What would then take it to highly competitive is if you had the funds to offer some type of upfront capital assistance to knock off um, the, the, the burden of upfront um, capital expenditures of a project. So forgivable loans, cash grants, and, and that sort of thing. And so you can kind of see what was offered here. Um, and we put yellow, green, red. So property tax abatement, it was a seven year abatement. That's, that's good, I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Most communities are typically doing a 10 year abatement. Um, at a minimum. Expedited permits, um, fee, uh, permit waivers. You guys did the expedited permits, and not necessarily the permit waivers. And that's something that I want to talk about for a second. Because if you're actually valuing economic incentives, those have little to no value. Let me rephrase that. They have a lot of value. They don't have a whole lot of monetary value. It's usually a value of time. So it's very difficult to value that from a quantitative perspective. And so since it's, it's, it's hard to, to monetize that, I can see how some would assume that they're really not that important, so who cares if you give them or you don't. The problem is the vast majority of communities in the Southeast United States have enacted some type of expedited permit plan, and almost across the board they waive all permitting fees. Does it really amount to a whole lot of money? Probably not, not really. But it's gotten to the point that it's so pervasive that I think companies just assume that it's going to happen. I don't think they expect it to happen and they're acting from a sense of entitlement, but it's just so pervasive that it's, it's almost it's an assumption when you go into a community. And so not having that, do I think it really makes a difference from a monetary perspective? Not really. Um, I mean, I don't know how much permit waiver or permits are here and the costs associated with that, but it's probably not too dissimilar from other parts of the United States. Um, but it, for a community that a company is going to see red flags of city and county working together, I think it's one added layer that could be indicative of that. Competitive land or uh, free land discounted real estate option, um, that's also pretty common across the United States, um, and especially in the Southeast for projects like this. I would say 50% of the communities out there are giving away free land for this. And I understand some communities just can't do it. They've got costs associated with getting the, the, the real estate to the developable um, process that it's in, and they have to recoup some of that cost. Some it's feasible, some it's not. Half of the communities, that, that's, a, that's a very, that's a commonly used tool for them. Um, and then cash grants for giving away loans. Maybe 25% of communities are in a position to do this. It's not something I really worry about too terribly much. It'd be nice if you had some type of fund that could kind of help close the gap at the very end of a project process. But again, it's not something I'd worry about too terribly much because 10, maybe 25% of communities actually have the, the financial wherewithal to do this. And so if I was looking at what incentive package you guys submitted of what I would view as highly competitive, or what's average for this region, I would say the package was about average. Competitive, not knock your socks off, um, potentially good enough. 
Um, and that goes into a whole broader discussion about the role of economic incentives and site selection that, that we could have. Um, but it was it was it was an average package. And that's not necessarily bad, it's not necessarily great. It's certainly not gonna win you any projects, probably not gonna lose you any either unless someone out there is just buying the project. So after we went through this, kind of my initial community impressions through the corporate lens, the perceived business advantages, um, obviously low operating cost structure, um, logistics and availability. I personally think that your access to all of the different ports in the Southeast United States is going to be a bigger advantage in five years than it is now. Um, it, port access on the East Coast is something that's only going to, is going to become more and more, more important. Um, and, and you're set up from a geographic perspective to handle that very well. Um, state and local business environment from a cost perspective. Quality real estate options. So Andrea drove me around all the industrial parks um, this morning. I got to see and I was incredibly impressed. There's not many communities this size that have as much shovel-ready developable industrial land as you guys have. I can tell a lot of money has been spent over last several years preparing a lot of those assets. Um, I, I was very impressed with that. And then post-secondary education presence, I mean, you have 20,000 plus college students here. Um, perceived concerns. So especially when we talk about projects like advanced manufacturing and some of those higher end projects. Um, lack of engineering talent. So again, I'll go back to it. If, if you're a company and you've got to hire a significant amount of, of engineers, and almost every advanced manufacturing project does, you can either hire from the unemployed or underemployed. The fact is there's not a lot of those currently employed here. The occupation presence is, is very low. You can recruit talent to the area. Every single employer we talked about said it's, going to, it's difficult to recruit talent here. They love it once they, I mean, just most small communities like this, once you get them here, they love it, and they're lifetime residents. But getting them here is a challenge. Um, and the other is developing them through the post-secondary pipeline. Well, right now, none of your post-secondary institutions offer any of these degrees that I'm aware of. We looked at completion statistics, and they're mostly focused on business programs, liberal arts programs, and things like that. You know, Wiregrass does have some precision production and some maintenance um, mechanic and repair type programs, but by and large, kind of that high-level professional services, engineering type talent, it, it's not being developed here. So if you look at those three prongs, none of that's going on here. Um, and that would be a concern for a, a high level project. Your overall workforce availability metrics, and there's something specifically I want to talk about here that was puzzling to me. You have 20,000 college students in, in right here. Your population is 140,000 in the NSA. That's a pretty high if from a relative perspective, that's a relatively high amount of college students <coughs> per population, especially for a community this size. But when you look at education attainment, education attainment skewed towards high school and less than high school more than your average tier four Southeast United States community. So basically what that's suggesting is none of the college students are staying here. Um, I don't know that. But that's what the data suggests. So if I was hired on behalf, of, that would be another thing that I would spend a lot of time trying to really get to the bottom of that. Um, difficulty recruiting talent, we talked about that. Um, the perceived lack of coordination, and then average economic incentive offering. And I put the economic incentive offering at the, at the, at the bottom. I'm one of the rare, let me rephrase that, we are one of the rare site selection firms that we don't really put as much of an emphasis on economic incentives as a lot of others do because economic incentives are meant to be used to draw a fine distinction between two very good communities that will satisfy you from an operations perspective. Um, and so if I'm ranking these uh, in order of, of how I perceive the their concern, they're, they're ranked probably adequately. At least economic incentives at the end is, is certainly reflective of that. That being said, 
I've got some other kind of support slides if people have questions or want to want to discuss a lot of this, but I'd really just kind of like to have a discussion, clarify anything that we've talked about, talk about any issues um, you know that the community is facing that we could potentially shed some light on or anything you might want to talk about. Jack, I have a question.